Okay, it's time for our March wrap-up. March was the longest month of my life. Uh, the first week I defended, it happened, but that week also led to a week of just exhaustion, and then I've been job hunting, and like, how has it only been 31 days? I literally... It's the longest month I have lived in a very long time. Also meant that I read 14 books, which is a lot. That means like I was almost reading a book like every two days, every two and a half days, and I read some really long books. <laughs> but also I distinctly remember not reading much for the first five days of the month. So I really don't know how this month happened. But per usual, I'm just gonna talk about books in certain categories. We're gonna start off with one that's not in a category, but there is a whole live show. And per usual, there'll be timestamps down below to any channels, videos, and the books I mentioned, so you can hop around if that's what you wanna do. First one I'll just briefly mention is Hood Feminism. We just had a two plus hour live show discussion on Jess Owens' channel, so if you wanna know all my thoughts, I will direct you there. We had Mara from Books Like Woe, Elle from Elliot Brooks, um, Brie from The Locked Booktician. It was a fantastic discussion, highly recommend. I feel like I've also talked about this briefly on Friday Reads. This is a very good introductory piece on feminism and how it needs to be intersectional, and here are the ways it should be intersectional. It's very much a nonfiction where you do get little snippets of stories from the author herself, like her life experiences, but also just a lot of things that are pointed out like, this is an issue here, and here are different pieces you can look into to get more depth. Like, it's not about the depth of a topic particularly, it's kind of actually pointing out a bunch of different topics that you could then dive into, and we actually have a whole list of book recommendations on Jess Owens' community tab that is related to that book club discussion so yeah, highly recommend. We'll point you there. It was a good nonfiction. Excited for our next batch of nonfiction for May to discuss in June. Keep your eye out for that announcement video or just watch the live. We discuss it there as well. So now into the categories. And we're going to start off kind of negative just to get the negative energy out of the way. If you do not like negative energy, go into the timestamps. Move on. But these are books that have left my mind. <laughs> So maybe it's not even that negative, but as I was putting this together, I normally am pretty good at keeping a grip on stories that I read, even if I don't love them. Like, I, I keep stories in my brain for a pretty long time because it's just, I don't know, it's information my brain has decided to keep. Not character names, but just generally I tend to not forget stories that I've consumed. These ones have all left my mind. In particular, The Worst Offender is Crossroads of Twilight. I, that book is 800 pages long. I am literally struggling to remember what happened in this book. Like, I do know things happened. I'm not trying to be hyperbolic and be like, nothing happened in this book. Things happened. I cannot remember any of it. Like, in terms of moving plot arcs forward, that's not what this book was doing. This book kind of felt like we were following the perspectives of characters that didn't know what happened in the previous book and getting them caught up to the timeline that we were at at the end of the previous book. And it wasn't until like the very end of this book that we were all on the same timeline again. And we'll talk about a different book on this list that does kind of the same thing. And I love that book and I don't love this book, but my main issues are just, no one's doing anything interesting. Like I think Elaine's sections were my, mo my most favorite, but that's because there are actual like character interactions happening in those sections, if that makes sense. But yeah, I, I legitimately, as I was making notes for this, normally I actually have thoughts on Wheel of Time books. They don't all leave my mind. I actually am pretty good at remembering what events happen in what book, but this one, I'm just, it is, it is all left my mind. <laughs> I do not know what happened. It is what it is. Uh, next one is The Last Story of Minna Lee. This one just, it just really didn't work for me, and I'm just happy that we already had our book club discussion and I don't have to think about it anymore. I was kind of disappointed because I actually really like this kind of style of historical fiction where you have a timeline with a family member and then you have a present day character who's trying to get to know that family member better. Um, but I think I just didn't love the conceit or the idea that the present day character would suddenly just like find herself in the setting of a cozy mystery sort of thing, even though it's not cozy. I wouldn't say any of this is like cozy mystery sort of thing. But like there was a lot of suspension of disbelief that I needed to do for like the main concept of the present timeline. I really liked the past timeline. But in general, I like barely remember the main character's name. I think it's Margot. I don't know. It was fine. I definitely feel like there are other um, books with these themes and the setup that I would recommend way before this one. I actually don't know what triggered this one to get all the popularity that it did. Like it's fine, but 
I actually actively didn't enjoy finishing this book. I had to before moderating a book club, but I, I was not enjoying my time. I didn't like the writing style and I didn't like the main character. I don't think she was a poorly constructed main character, but I still didn't like her. <laughs> so there's that. And then the last one, this is like, honestly, not is the least offensive of these. But honestly, I don't know how to talk about this book. And part of it is that I don't think about it much, which is kind of a downside for the amount of work I had to put into that. And that is Destroyer of Light. Um, so this is the highest rated of this list, obviously, like I think this is three and a half stars and the other ones were like in the two, two and a half stars. So this is a much better book. Objectively, I actually liked the craft of this book quite a bit. And I cared about it a bit. Um, this is a dark version of the Persephone tale, or I mean, depending on how you interpret the original, but it's loosely based off that. But in general, I don't I think if you search for Persephone in this, it'll be obvious when you finish the story, but you're just going to be confused while consuming it, if that makes sense. And it's a really intriguing sci-fi setting. You're on a different planet. It's a tidally talked, locked world. You have aliens. There's some cyberpunk elements there. It's really interesting. I really liked the world of it. I even like that it's nested narrative structure and we have different narrative point of views and it's a pretty confusing storytelling and the writing style I actually really liked how descriptive it was and I liked how the sentences were formed but it was a lot of work for my brain there was a density to it it didn't just go really quickly for me and it's gruesome like it is so dark um and it's one of those things where if you need content warnings I'd look them up because there are graphic depictions of things on the page if that makes sense like it's not just like we mentioned something it's like no you get to experience it with the characters um they're child soldiers child assault like it's it's a very dark world and that said, I don't really know how I feel about the ending. Like, I didn't take anything away from it. I think once we got to the ending, I'm like, ah, and here's the end of the Persephone story, kind of. Like, I saw how it all connected. But I felt kind of let down by that because I didn't really care that it was a retelling of Persephone. I actually really liked the issues on this world and the questions we were trying to ask. And this would have been something that should have been an entire series, potentially. But it's a 300-page book that was actually quite dense and difficult for me to read. And I don't really have any takeaways emotionally, thematically, like, I don't know the names of any of these characters. I just remember the vibes and the setting and it wasn't a waste of my time, for sure. Like I said, I think the art of this book is actually quite interesting, but it didn't have like the payoff that I like for the amount of work that I put into it. Well, next transition into books that I just completely escaped into, and that's romance. I read two romances this month, one a contemporary romance, which I think this is my first contemporary romance, and that's the love hypothesis. And the hype was real for me. Um, it, it, it connected with me. I loved this book. I started it at 2 p.m. one day and finished it at 9 p.m. It was perfect. And it was one of the first times I felt legitimate joy and excitement after my defense because the like emotional and physical fallout of that whole process was real. So it was really great. I love Grumpy Sunshine. Everyone, people say about it. It's true. It's fun. Um, if you are a graduate student like me, um, and people have been trying to tell you it doesn't have graduate school stuff in it. No, no, no. It's definitely very, like, a lot of the conflict is based in struggles in graduate school. So just be aware of that. It's nothing bad. It's just depending on where you are in your process. Like, the mental health of being a graduate student is universally known to be poor, I guess we'll just say. And I also read Slave to Sensation, the first uh, Psy Changeling book. And this was really fun. Like, it was just a really fun time. I think, like a lot of romance books, I cared more about the romance than the plot that existed, but I didn't mind the plot. And I've enjoyed learning about this world through the plot. I'm excited to see what happens over the course of, like, all of these books in this world. And I, I liked the dynamic between the characters. I thought there were some fun, like things that were used, narrative devices to like help us understand how these relationships formed. And like there were some like cozy aspects that like I remembered from reading New Moon or something by Stephanie Meyer where like I was among a pack again because uh, inside Changeling you have changelings and they typically have alphas and are in packs and stuff and you have the um, the Psy who are telepathic it's really fun. It reminded me of an Octavia Butler series in terms of the world building, which is uh, the Pattern Master series. It's not nearly as dark. This is way different, but that type of sci-fi futuristic thing. And I don't know, like, I don't reread 
the Twilight series. It doesn't bring me the joy it did when I was a high schooler. But there's some moments in that series I really liked. And one of them is like being with the pack with people and like that found family thing. And that came across here. So I'm hoping that continues and we keep getting really great community moments like that in addition to fun romances. So yeah, I'm excited to keep going. It was a really fun time. I'm hoping that these are going to scratch the itch that I usually go to Sarah J Mass for because she has let me down recently. And now we will get into novellas. So I read two novellas. One is Artificial Condition, the second Murderbot book. This was really fun. Consumed this in a day. And it was generally a good time. Um, the first one reminded me of like an episode of TV. And that's the same here where it's just like, just a one-off thing about Murderbot going on adventure. They're like Doctor Who to me. I don't know if anyone consumes Doctor Who. But it's very much that type of sci-fi experience is what I get reading Murderbot. And then of course, Murderbot is a main character going through his mental health stuff, or I guess their mental health stuff and like meeting a new entity to interact with that interaction was fantastic in this book and also just coming to terms with and I feel like this is me too, like in my current state of I'm good at my job. And I like to do my job. I just want to do my job on my own terms with like certain respect around that, you know, like I just want to be respected and treated well to do something I know how to do well, if that makes sense. And I liked Murderbot figuring that out. So I'm excited to keep going on through this series. Like, I don't think it's going to be like a favorite of all time, but they're really fun. And I see why people really love these books. Next one is Over the Woodward Wall. This is the first in the novellas that are written for the middle game world. Um, they're written in a different pen name for Sean and McGuire. And they are there are excerpts from this book in middle game. Um, I just started my reread of middle game. So it's kind of interesting. And I wanted to read this before my reread because I just know there are parallels between these two within the world of middle game, an important historical figure wrote this middle grade series and it was meant to be like a way of hiding the secrets of alchemy and things like that but also just in its own right if you like you know Alice in Wonderland if you like the Wizard of Oz if you like Narnia like if those are the things you like but you just want a different twist on it with new characters to follow it was a wonderful fairy tale time like definitely could be read by a middle grade audience but it was also obviously written for an adult audience, maybe? I don't know if this is true, actually. But like, when I read it as an adult, I'm like, oh, yeah, this is like the beats of a kid's fairy tale. But also, I felt like the themes were a little more blatant or the metaphors, at least I was seeing a lot of my own journey in the journey of these kids. It was really interesting. And it's been really fun knowing the context of the novella as I reread Middle Game and Anticipation of Seasonal Fears. So it was really fun. I'm excited to get to the sequel in that. I don't love these two kids as much as I love Roger and Dodger, which I'm a little disappointed in because I know they're meant to be basically similar to those two characters, but I just think I get to become more attached to them in the contemporary setting of Middle Game than I do the kind of whimsical portal fantasy of Over the Woodward Wall. We'll see if that increases over time. Like, I did start to get closer to them, but this was definitely more of vibes and you know, ambiance book for me and very plot driven than it was character driven. Next up, we'll talk about some climate sci-fi. And I think I am going to eventually do a whole recommendation video because I've read a lot of sci-fi that is near future sci-fi based off climate change problems. But these are the two I read this month. And the first one is the new release that everyone has opinions on. And that's how high we go in the dark. Oh boy, do I have thoughts. I don't, I, I've picked a rating. I think it's based more on the consumability of reading it. Like, in terms of the content, I'm still pretty like weirded out about what this book is and what it's doing. <laughs> and I'm, I have questions about if it succeeded in its goals for me as a reader. But in terms of like, I read this book and I wanted to be reading this book every day I was reading it, check. So that's like a pretty high part of my rating scale is, did I want to be reading you? Another part of it is, do I keep thinking of you after the fact? Or what did you make me think of? And this is an odd one. And I think for both of these that I'm gonna mention in this section is that, it's not very grounded in reality, but it tricks you into thinking that it is initially. Like the first two sections, you feel pretty grounded in the setup that you've been given. This is based off climate change causing the resurgence of this virus that leads to a pandemic. And then we are just following the, cor the course of this pandemic and humanity's response. That's that's the story. Um, and it, I mean, I have been telling people that it's Love Actually, the sad edition, because <laughs> that's essentially how it is. There are short stories and they're all interconnected in a similar way to if you've watched the Christmas movie Love Actually, where, oh, I saw this character in this story, and now they're in here, and this is how this is connected, and you just see all of these connections the entire time. 
Um, the thing that's jarring for me, though, I don't mind this a short story narrative. That's actually what made me want to pick it up. Um, in that vein, some are going to be hits or misses. What I wasn't expecting is how um, low sci-fi, magical realism sci-fi we were getting into. I don't even know if magical realism sci-fi is a thing. Ethereal? I don't know. Things were getting weird and metaphysical in odd ways. And I was unprepared. And it kind of just kept going there. And... I don't know, It's it was so weird how many sci-fi genres and concepts got put into this work. So I was kind of just interested in that, and I did find, I personally, some closure on that odd style of doing this sci-fi. But what I didn't end up taking away from this, that some people have taken a lot more from than me, is any thematic connection, any caring about the characters. Like, I took nothing away from this other than I was just watching things burn. Like, I just was watching it happen. I wasn't relating it to my own life. I wasn't connecting it to the characters. I didn't find any meanings. And that's okay. Not every book has to. That's why I'm still giving this, like, a four star and stuff like that. But I do think that if this is what you thought it was a literary sci-fi where you would get stuff from, that's going to be very dependent on you and what you bring to the book and how you connect to it. Because I think face value... The book's just not going to, like, impart wisdom on you. I don't know. It was one of those books, though, that when I finished it, like, I was just like, huh. Like, I don't feel the need to reread it because it kind of made sense what it did based off every other weird thing it was doing. But the ending was odd, and, like, I did feel closure. I was like, okay. But it, it's not a happy time. Also, it wasn't as sad as I thought it would be. Like, but it was pretty sad. Like, it's pretty depressing what the state of the world is based off of the premise. And then the next one is, Do You Dream of Terra 2? And this one is basically, we know the world is ending, so part of it is we know there's a planet we could live on. Let's send these people that are going to go on this 25-plus year journey to get to this planet. And initially, I was lukewarm on this book. Like, I was fine. It was very consumable, like the previous book. But I wasn't connecting to the characters. Again, I was having this issue. And part of that was the first part of this book is about getting ready to leave, and everyone is full of anxious anticipation. And I think that made a lot of everyone's thoughts very similar, which makes sense. A lot of people get nervous and crave similar things when they're preparing for these big, life-changing moments. Like, I can't even imagine being put in this situation. But once... The first part was done. It was the most satisfying part of this. We're following these character arcs. Like, there, again, like the last book, there were times where I felt grounded in hard sci-fi, but then it became not hard sci-fi, which I don't mind if things are low sci-fi. It's just I feel jarred when I feel settled in, okay, we are in the future or alternative space, but when we're following XYZ rules that are established in our universe. And then we're like, but actually, here's some, like, supernatural spice. <laughs> and then I'm just like, oh... I was unprepared. All right, I'll try and go with it. But it, it's jarring for me personally. And also there were just moments where I was just... It's like because I've read stuff like The Martian and it was trying to at times be as put together and thoughtful as The Martian in terms of we have all of our sci-fi world building ducks in a row. I was just like, okay, I'm following the plot and I care because things are stressful right now. But also, isn't there a solution where we could do X? <laughs> Because I, like, watched Apollo 13 and a bunch of stuff. So, I don't know. There were a lot of things that were hard for me to suspend my disbelief on in the world building of it. And I, it's weird to say world building. But, like, in the execution of, st like, space travel, based of what knowledge was given to me and the tone that was set, I would be a little confused at times as to what situations you could do what to, like, I don't know. If you've read the book, I think you know what I'm talking about. It basically has to do with part three. I just... I felt like it was weird that they were stuck in a situation that they were in and that there was a solution that existed. I don't know. But in general, though, when I finished this book, again, I felt a lot of closure because the arcs of these characters were so good. The discussion of what happens to an overachiever when you have achieved what you were meant to overachieve, like, that is a big discussion I really liked in this. Um, just the idea of like, when I'm reading this book, I was like, this feels wrong. Like, this doesn't seem like a good idea. And then actually parsing that out and picking that apart. What happens to people in isolation? Lots of discussion on mental health. And I just, I actually really liked watching that journey as the story progressed. So for that reason alone, I had a fantastic time. Like, even with all of my other little quibbles, I, I think this book actually did something pretty impressive. <laughs> in my mind. So, and it was a page turner for a book that honestly didn't necessarily have that many moments to make it a page turner. I don't know if that makes sense. Like, I wouldn't say it's a plot-driven book, 
but it's a book where you kept wanting to see what was developing because like it's really tense and melancholy and you don't know what's going to happen it's a heavy book that is easy to read it's weird so those are the sci-fi and then the last section we'll talk about are some fantasy faves because <laughs> uh you probably saw in the thumbnail I, I had a good time this month but we'll first start i finished the queens of renthia i read the queen of sorrow I, I was prepared to maybe not like this as much as the other books because that seems to have been the trend with my friends who have read this trilogy and i still really liked it but not as much as the other two just I don't know some of the focus of the plot and like there was stuff at the end I think it's just that the ending wasn't as strong as I wanted it to be like honestly everything up till the ending was typical Queens of Renthea four and a half star consumable stuff and then the ending happened and I'm like this is not a bad ending this ending will not prevent me from reconsuming the series one day it is not bad but also why is this the end why can't we have just had more books like I feel like there were problems that were introduced and I wanted to explore it I wanted to explore more in this world. I wasn't done with it. I did not want to leave. And I just, uh, the ending was a way out, but I, I wanted to stay. I really did. The series that I've read three books of this month, <laughs> Chorus of Dragons. I, I'm obsessed, guys. I'm obsessed. <laughs> like, I read The Memory of Souls in three and a half days, okay? That is a 620-page book. Like... <laughs> I've immersed and read all of this. I've discussed them in Friday Reads. I am going to put together a series review one day, but I guess quick-ish thoughts. It is everything I want from a fantasy series. And what does that mean? There are magical elements and magic gods walking among men. There are magical creatures. You get to interact and have adventures with these magical creatures and places frequently. This isn't like they save it for the final act. You can be in act one or act two and awesome stuff's happening, okay? So I, I love that pacing of like, oh, big things are happening. And then you have the quiet moments of characters interacting, learning about the world. I think the way that they handle time jumps is done really well. Yes, there is nested narrative. Yes, it is confusing because in this world there's soul swapping at times. So sometimes you don't know who's in whose body and it's a little weird and the family tree is messed up because there's also reincarnation. There's a lot going on. But at the same time, the gist of it, like the like first level, the the plot is actually, I think, very accessible. Like having complete knowledge of it, being able to get like an A on an exam on this book series, maybe a little harder. But like the main characters don't even really know what's happening. And I think that's what makes the plot fun. Like I've just read the third book and I now truly understand what we're trying to accomplish. And it's so exciting. And up to that point, I didn't need to know because I was just enjoying watching my characters exist and trying to pivot and adjust tactically to new information because there's a lot of withheld information. It's one of those series where you do not actually know what is the right side. You're just like, well, I guess I just care about these characters and hope they make it out okay. I am obsessed with the romantic relationship that was introduced. Like, oh my goodness, I have not been so ride or die for something in so long. <laughs> Oh my goodness, it's so good. Like, we have four chosen ones, essentially. Um, and our four chosen ones are everything <laughs> to me. I love them all so much. So I'm very connected to the characters. I really like all of the elements of fantasy that are in here. Like, it's also even like dying earth fantasy, okay? Like, it has all of these touches that are just like my aesthetic, my thing. And in the package that it comes in, is really fun for me. I'm just having a blast all of the time. So that was probably way too long. And I didn't even tell you what the plot is, but like I said, part of it is you don't really know. I can say in the first book, you follow Kieran. And Kieran, when you meet him, is trapped with his jailer and him and his jailer recount basically, how did we get here? And there's a lot involved in how Kieran got there. He, the first book is about his basically coming of age story and how he got there. And the second book's about a different chosen one's coming of age story. And hers is so cool because her people have like this relationship with horses and there are these magical horse creatures and there's this whole gender dynamic and like hierarchy that exists there. It was so fun. Like the world is so vibrant. There are so many races of people. The history is so long and you get to learn about it like I have so many questions and I get answers and it, it's just it's just so fun and snarky sassy footnotes guys so good highly recommend the audio though like I mean I've been immersion reading this the entire time and I'm not going to change I have an arc of the discord of gods I'm not reading it till I have the audiobook so I'm going to have to wait till the release day or something 
But that's this video. I've read a lot of books. I'm hoping to read even more books. <laughs> in April if you haven't already seen that ridiculous TBR. Let me know some of your highlights from the previous month. If you want to leave an emoji, leave a dragon for Chorus of Dragons because like legitimately guys, I'm having so much fun. Like, I don't know, like if there's a chance that you think you could have as much fun as I'm having, you really probably should at least attempt it. It might not work for you because of its weird style, but like, oh, I'm having so much fun. It's been great. Um, but yeah, other than that, like if you liked it, subscribe if you want to, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.